What do the following have in common? A dishwasher, the Bluetooth connection between a cell phone and a car, a vacuum, and a GPS. Thank you. Just think about it. Let's see how loud. I'll give you some more clues. Some of you think, oh, I think I know what it is, okay? Uh, we're trying to figure out what do they have in common. So a clothes washer and dryer, a microwave, a coffee pot. Did you figure it out yet? A smartphone, a computer, the automated garage door opener, ooh, and uh, a food processor. Do you have a guess? What do you think it is? What do they all have in common? Who has a guess? They probably have more than one thing in common, but I'm, I'm trying to make a point here, so don't argue with me. Any guesses? Uh, appliances? What were you going to say, Kevin? They do a job. They do a job? I like it. Okay. No, um, these things are true, so uh, no, no argument there. But I would say uh, where I want to lead our thinking here in a moment is to realize they're all time-saving devices. Okay? Think about the kind of difference that these things make in our lives. Uh, I don't have to spend time standing at the sink, scrubbing and rinsing and washing and drying. I could stick them in the dishwasher and then go and do other things, right? A, a time-saving device. Uh, or, uh, you know, the microwave, I think, is a really obvious go-to one there. You could put something in the oven, and often we do, but it goes a lot faster if you stick it in the microwave, as long as it's not going to ruin whatever food it is that you're warming up. Uh, and, and so now that we have so many time-saving devices in our lives, uh, do we, do we just like sit around bored and with nothing to do because uh, there's nothing on our to-do list? Is, is that how it goes? <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, we've got more time-saving devices now than what we've ever had available to us in the past. And yet the weird thing uh, that I observe is that we actually feel, many of us actually feel like we have less time. I, I, I'm busier. I've got so many things on my schedule. I've got more to do. And, and I reflect here on the conversation that we started a week ago. So if you weren't together with us, uh, if you weren't able to see that uh, video a week ago, I encourage you to go and uh, watch that video available online. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors. And uh, this is the conversation that we're reflecting on, this instruction from God that we're thinking about here for these few weeks together. And because he told us we need to love our neighbors, I believe that we need some really practical ways to go about doing that. It's one thing to say, go love people. It's quite another thing to figure out exactly how am I going to do that, especially considering some of the neighbors that we have, right? Because some neighbors are fantastic, and other neighbors, neighbors maybe take a little bit more work to get along with. One way or another, our neighbors have this huge impact on our lives. Uh, whether you like them, whether you know them, whether you don't get along, uh, whether you have no idea what their names are, they, they still have an effect upon you. And oftentimes... Uh, we think about what it means to, uh, to love people along the lines of uh, it's anybody, anywhere, with any problem. And if, as long as I'm helping out somebody with uh, whoever it is, anybody, in any location, with any problem, it's this really wide, really broad definition. And I think that's a poor definition. So we talked about this a week ago, our response often to such a huge problem of anyone, anywhere, with any problem, frequently is paralysis. If the problem is so big, then we don't end up doing anything. And I feel like that is um, concerning to me, considering some of the things that Jesus said about loving our neighbors. So a week ago, we worked on an exercise called a block map. And uh, if, you, if you didn't uh, fill out a block map when we were together a week ago, congratulations, you get to fill one out today. And uh, I can help step you through what that looks like. Uh, uh, or you can uh, watch the video from a, a week ago and, and see some uh, more detailed instructions on that as well. I want to know how many of you who, who filled out that block map, how many of you put it somewhere to display it uh, where you would see it almost every day? I see a few hands going up. Yeah, good, good. That's the challenge. I, I, want, I want each of us to not only fill out the paper, but to stick it where you're going to see it, whether it's on the fridge or on your bathroom mirror, or on your dashboard of your car. Just don't wreck your car. Don't do it. I know you were thinking about it. Don't do it. Uh, stick it somewhere where you're going to see it, and then the challenge is to keep it there for at least 30 days. And um, so, you know, like I mentioned, if you didn't have a, a chance to fill that out when we were together a week ago, that's okay. I've got copies of it right here. There are copies of it uh, over in the NAS Cafe, uh, or, you know, just talk with me after worship, and I'll, I'll make sure to get you a copy of that. To. And uh, it, it's an exercise that I feel like is helpful to us as we're thinking about these practical ways that we can love our neighbors. I want you to um, just kind of 
turn a mirror on yourself and, and think for a moment about your schedule. Think about your to-do list. Think about the rhythm of your life. What I observe when I look at my life and when I look at the lives of a lot of people around me is that we are busy people. And the number one obstacle to good neighboring, among other obstacles, but the number one obstacle is time. It's time. So you've got Jesus coming along saying, I want you to love your neighbors. You've got your pastor standing in front of you saying, I want you to love your neighbors. And many of us are thinking to ourselves, honestly, I don't have time to add another thing onto the list of things that I need to get done. Uh, despite all those time-saving devices that I mentioned very briefly before, you're, you're asking me to do more than what I'm already doing? I just had a conversation a couple days ago with a married couple who was talking about uh, their kids becoming more involved in sports. Any parent that's got a kid in sports knows that is going to suck up your time. And I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It's just it, it's an investment of time. We're really busy people. And, and so we ask ourselves, am I living at a pace that allows me to love my neighbors? Am I, am I um, in, in the commitments that I have made and the priorities that I have established, am I living at such a pace that, that I am actually able to do what Jesus has asked for me to do? And for those of us that have this very busy, very stressed, very hectic pace in life, oftentimes the answer is, I'm just, I'm not able to because of my time constraints. And I feel like it's a barrier, it's an obstacle for us to be able to love our neighbors the way that God asks for us to. The culture that we live in really values production. It values accomplishment. Our culture values achievement. And so it, it's just constantly reinforcing this idea in our minds and our decision making that we need to go right from one task to another. As soon as I finish one task, the moment it's done, I feel compelled to start up the next one. And so I'm just going and going on my unending to-do list here. And instead of those time-saving devices actually making my life be able to have some breathing moments, I find myself with less free time. And I, I own most of those time-saving devices. I imagine that you own many of them as well. So why is it then? If if it's stressful, if it's frustrating, why is it that we live in this kind of a hectic pace? I mean, do you like it? Do you like feeling like you're in a rush? Like you're feeling hurried? Like you gotta go, 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 I can see you shaking your heads. No, I don't like it either. Uh, that sort of pressure, that constant unending, I've got more to do, it's, it's not pleasing. So why do we do that? Why do we live at such a hectic pace? I believe the reason for it is because we believe certain lies. And these lies, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, they, they have an effect upon us whether we realize it or not. These lies are impacting the hectic pace of our lives even if we're not thinking about them. If we're not thinking, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm, I'm, you know, in my mind, I know this, this is an idea and, and I'm aware that it's a lie. Probably not, because if I believe it, then I, you know, I'm probably not aware that it's a lie. I probably think that it's True, let's look at these here just real briefly. The first one is, things will settle down one day. How many of you have said that or something along those lines? It's gonna settle down one day. I, did you notice I put my hand up? Okay, not just as an example for you to put your hand up, but I put my hand up because, yeah, I have said that out loud. I see your hands. If I could just get through the new year, then it's gonna settle down. Okay, well, if I can just you know, get into what's my new schedule in January, and then it's gonna settle, well, you know, if I can just kinda get my way through Valentine's Day and make sure that my sweetheart's feeling loved and all this, and then, then things will settle down and that, well, what I really need to do is I gotta get through spring break, and at spring break, then I'll finally be able to relax have you ever come home from a vacation and felt like you need a vacation? <laughs> right? Yeah? I'm not happy if we feel that way, but we, we believe this lie. It's going to settle down one day. My friend, it is not true. There are only two ways that it's going to settle down. Only two. The first is you die. Because you don't usually do as much when you're dead. Okay? The second way is if we become more intentional about the way we spend our time. That's how it'll settle down. It's not gonna do it on its own. And so in your mind, if you're thinking to yourself, uh, or if reflect on it, maybe you're thinking it, but you didn't realize that you're thinking it, that it's gonna settle down one day, you gotta cut that out. That's stinking thinking. It's just simply not true. Second lie here, more 
will be enough. Sometimes we think or we act in ways that suggest we believe it's true, even though it isn't. This idea that, well, you know, if I, I can just have one more purchase, if I could just have one more achievement, I know people who chase after this and they go from um, event to event or purchase to purchase thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna be so happy once I finally get this thing. And you know what happens when you finally get the thing? You know it, right? You want the next thing. It, it, it's true of all of us. And so we tell ourselves more will be enough, whether it's more activity or more things to have more, to do more, to be more. I want more, I want more, I need more, and I can just get a little bit more, and then finally my life won't be so stressful. Except it's a lie. It's not true. Third lie, everybody lives like this. This is the mindset that some people have. When they think about the stressful, hectic pace of how we're pressured with our time, Often, a lot of people think to themselves, well, that's how it is for everybody. We, we just, we normalize it in our thinking. And when we normalize it, uh, we think that oh, being overly busy is normal. Well, then why wouldn't we follow suit? I mean, if, if that's just how it is for everybody, then of course that's how it's going to be for me. And that's not going to prompt us to make any effort to implement change. Because we think, well, that's just how it is. That's what it's like for everybody. Everybody lives the, this way. Well, it's, it's simply not true. Not everyone lives at the frantic, hectic, stressful pace. And the fourth lie I'm going to list here for you is that I don't have a choice. Ever felt that way about your to-do list? I mean, it may not actually be written down. You might not actually have a physical list, but you've got things that you know that you need to get done. And you might say to yourself, well, I don't have any choice in the matter. I got to do these things. And, and that lie applies not only to the things that we actually really do need to get done, but it, that lie also begins to apply to the other things that we, that we feel like we got to get done, but do we? Do we really? And, and that lie, it, it, it's like a brush that paints far more than what it should, as if it's beyond my control. And if it's beyond my control, then there's really nothing that I should do about it because there's nothing that I can do about it, as if it's beyond my control, as if I have to live this way. I think about when Jesus said in John 10, one of the reasons he came, and he talked about his purpose more than once, but in John 10, verse 10, he said, I have come that you would have life to the full. Have you heard that line before? Have you read that line before? I have come so that you would have life to the full. He didn't mean a full schedule. He wasn't talking about a full to-do list. That's not what he meant when he said that. He meant a, a meaningful, rich life. Life that's filled with blessings, even the blessing of rest. So if we are going to say yes to this command from God, love your neighbor, if we're going to do that, I believe that we're going to have to make some adjustments in the way that we spend our time. We're going to have to look at how we're prioritizing our time. We're going to have to look at our commitments and say, mm, I'm going to have to say no even to some things that are good things. And that can be really tough. You ever met somebody who can just never say no? Maybe you're that somebody. <laughs> if if uh, you're next to that somebody, you know, don't look at them. Just poke them with your elbow. But it's hard to say no. And it's especially hard to say no to things that are good Things. I mean, it's easy to say no to someone, well, I don't want to do that. You know, hey, Steve, are you interested in X, Y, Z? No, 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 I don't want to do that. But when they come to me and say, like, well, do you, want to, do you want to do these things? Well, that sounds good. Yeah, I would enjoy that. And people, people would praise me if I did those things. They'd be really happy. Oh, Pastor Steve, he's doing such a great job. He does these things. They're good things. Same is true for you. Sometimes we're going to need to say no, even to good things. So I, I want for us to take a moment together to list off some of the good things that Jesus did. Think for a moment about what you've read about him, what you've heard about him, things that you know about Jesus, about his accomplishments. What, what are some of the things that Jesus did, good things? Anybody, just shout it out. He healed people. He healed people. That's excellent. Give me another one. He died, for our sins. he died for our sins. Give me another one. What did Jesus do? Just list off anything he did. Say it again. 
Yeah, he, he gave sight to people who were blind. What are some other things? He faced and defeated the devil. Yeah, he faced the devil and he defeated him. Yeah, Jesus was victorious. Can you think of some other ones? I know you've got them on your mind. Yeah, okay. So he was at a wedding. They ran out of wine. And he helped by changing water into wine so that the celebration was able to continue. Then an act of love that he did there at that wedding. What's something else that Jesus did? Prayed. He prayed. He spent time in prayer. Yeah. Okay, and I mean, we could spend a lot of time coming up with lots of things that he did, right? We, we could list them all out and, and think of some more things. So the question then, the next question for you is, do you feel like he got a lot done? Okay, I see some of you are nodding your head. Some of you are like, don't move. Don't. <laughs> I don't want to answer wrong. Don't move. Do you feel like he got a lot done? Okay. Do you feel like he got enough done? That's a whole different question, isn't it? I mean, he did some stuff. And then we could say he did a lot of stuff. But did he do enough stuff? Do you feel like he, he did enough? I see some of you nodding your heads. Yeah? Okay. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. She said, for the people who he helped, they definitely felt like he did enough. You know, if he has made a real difference in your life, you're like, yeah, yeah, thank you, Lord, thank you. So people uh, disagreed about how Jesus should spend his time. People disagree about how you should spend your time. Uh, you know, if you're married. <laughs> <laughs> If you're, if you're married, uh, or if you have observed people who are married, I am confident that you see there are different perspectives about the best way to spend time. And the people who disagreed about the way that Jesus should spend his time, some of those were like other religious leaders. Some of them were his disciples, his closest friends. Some of the people who disagreed about how he should spend his time included strangers or the crowds of people. There was this one instance in the Bible where Jesus agreed to heal uh, this little girl, this dying daughter of a religious leader. So, um, you know, in your mind, think about, uh, think about if Ainsley were sick and dying, and then Jesus agreed, I'm going to heal Ainsley. Okay, just picture this. If you don't know Ainsley, just picture a little, a little girl. And this story, this, this text... He had made the agreement he's going to heal this little girl who's dying. Because, I mean, like, it, it talks about how the father of that little girl came, came and literally fell down on his knees before Jesus. He is just begging, you've got to help my little girl. Um, we were praying here very recently about a little one and his parents who uh, he had an allergic reaction and went limp and needed to go to the ER. How terrifying. It wasn't all that long ago that we've had uh, kind of a similar situation like that in our congregation. Uh, so it's not far off and away, but it's, you know, think about that father. You've got to help. I can't fix this. Jesus, you've got to heal my little girl. And so he, he said he would do it. He agreed to do it. And they're on the way. Finally, good answer. You know, they're on their way to get this little girl healed. And when they're on the way there, Jesus stops. And he asks what really seems like a completely stupid question. Surrounded by people. And he goes, who touched me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Who t you're, you're surrounded by people. Everybody's touching you. And, and you know what the dad is thinking right now? Who cares? We got to go. And he took the time to heal another person in that crowd and then stop and talk with her. He could have just like, okay, you're healed, I'm moving on. But he didn't. He stopped. On the way to heal that little girl, he stopped to have a conversation with an unnamed woman. We have no clue who she is. Just somebody in the crowd that he helped out and then had a conversation with her there. And I am absolutely sure the dad of that dying girl was thinking to himself, Hurry up. Why are you talking with this woman? You, you said you would help my little girl. We got to go. And right as this was taking place, somebody interrupts the situation and they say, your, your little girl's dead. And I'm bringing the news. She's, she's gone. There's not even any point. 
in bothering the teacher, this guy who could potentially heal her, don't even bother him anymore. It's too late. I'm glad that wasn't the end of that story. And if you don't know the end of that story, you can read it in Mark 5. I encourage you to do that later. If I were that dad, it was my little girl who was dying. And Jesus was on the way to heal her. He agreed to heal her. But then he stopped. When It, it really seems like he didn't need to. And he has this conversation and then my girl dies, I would have decked the guy. You know somebody who's mad at God because things didn't go the way they wanted it to go. Maybe that somebody's you. Man. Have you, have you heard the, the illustration about like trying to fit the, the rocks and the pebbles and the sand and the water into a container? Have you heard about that? Have you seen that before? Okay, so the, the idea is like if you don't put the things in the right order, then they don't fit. You gotta start with the big ones, the big rocks, and then you gotta go onto the pebbles and they kind of fill in the space around the big rocks. And then you gotta go to the sand because that fills in the space around the pebbles and then you gotta do the water. And if you don't do it in the right order, then they don't fit. Okay, it's an illustration I think many of us are already familiar with. And if you don't set your priorities, if you don't establish the way that you uh, prioritize some things and how you spend your time instead of other things, if you don't set your priorities, someone else will do it for you. And usually, you're not going to like the way that winds up. Neither am I. So I think that it would be good for us to talk with the creator of time. For, for the one who made us and who made time. The one who we call our Lord, which means he's supposed to be the boss, the master, master over my schedule, master over my to-do list. I think it would be good for us to talk with, with him about how he says we should spend our time. But that's going to require the art of elimination. And I mentioned it earlier, this idea of saying no to good things in order that I can make sure that I have time for better things. Saying no to good activities, good ways to spend time, so that I make sure that I have time to do the things that are most important. And if you're going to do this, if you're thinking, oh, yeah, okay, I like the idea of having these kinds of priorities for my time, it would not be kind for me unless I at least warned you. People will not understand. They're going to see the way you spend your time, and they're going to think to themselves, oh, why are you doing that? Why are you spending time on this instead of that? Like, everybody does this over here, but why are you doing that over there? People will not agree if you choose to prioritize the spending of your time the way that God asks for you to. That father in the story of the little girl who died, he didn't understand, and he didn't like it. He was not happy about the way Jesus spent his time. In his perspective, the way that Jesus wasted time. That's how he felt, like it was a waste for Jesus to do that. But thankfully, for all those people who are around you who don't understand the way you choose to spend time, for all those people around you who don't agree with the way you prioritize spending time on this instead of that, for those people, remind yourself, they don't have to understand. They don't have to agree. I hope that is a freeing thought for you. They're not going to understand. They're not going to agree, many of them, but they don't need to. And I'm going to bless you with the freedom to say no. You're going to be presented with an opportunity very soon. Some of you today, maybe even before you leave this building, very soon, and you'll have an opportunity about how to spend your time. And I want you to think about spending your time doing what is good or spending your time doing what is better or spending your time doing what is best, understanding the cost that people are not going to like it if I choose this. They're not going to understand but they don't need to understand. And I want you to remem remember, I have the freedom to say no. You can say no sometimes. So people criticized Jesus 
about the way that he spent his time. They criticized him for spending time with sinners. They criticized him for spending time with prostitutes and thieves and, and scoundrels. That he had this reputation for the way that he spent time with all these people. They're like, well, you shouldn't be spending time with them. People even criticized Jesus for spending time with kids. Have you read about that or heard about that before? Jesus spending some time with kids and others, and they're like, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing that. I want you to see it with me. Uh, grab your Bible or borrow a Bible and look at Matthew 19. So in this paragraph we're going to look at here in just a moment in Matthew 19, we're going to observe one of these instances where Jesus was choosing to spend time in a way that some others thought, well, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be spending your time like that. Matthew 19. Matthew is about three quarters of the way through the Bible. Um, it's just after Malachi. It's right before um, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So you're looking for Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to start reading then in verse 13. Matthew 19, and starting in verse 13, it says this. Then the people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. Can you picture it? I mean, if you're a mom or a dad and you're like, I want God to bless my kid. Of course we do. I want Jesus to bless my kid. So they're bringing their kids to Jesus and they're saying, would you just, would you just put your hand on my kid? Just pray for my kid. Bless my kid. This is what they're asking for him to do. But the next phrase there says, but the disciples, that's Jesus' closest friends, those are the people who Jesus is teaching, the followers of Jesus, who he's training them up so that they can do the things that he does. His disciples rebuked them. To rebuke means to, to say, you shouldn't do that. You should stop. The disciples of Jesus are saying to these parents and these kids, you shouldn't be doing that. You gotta cut that out, you gotta stop. So they believed Jesus had more important ways that he should be spending his time. And Jesus did some fantastic things. It certainly doesn't say that Jesus had nothing else to do. That would be silly. We know he had some things that he needed to do, and they were probably thinking about some of those things, some of those good things that Jesus needed to do. Um, his upcoming week, like if you read the chapters that follow this particular text in, in Matthew 19, his upcoming week included teaching eternally significant parables, preparing his disciples for his death. That was a big deal, and he needed to help them get ready for that. It included healing blind people, and it included going to Jerusalem, which was tough for him because Jesus knew that's where they were going to murder him. He wasn't confused about going there. And this was all on his weekly schedule, coming up in the next seven days. What do I have to do right now? And he chose to spend time with some kids. It feels weird, doesn't it? So let's read a little bit further here. It's in verse 14. Jesus said, the disciples rebuked them, and then Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Look at the very last phrase. Or listen, if you don't have it in front of you. It says, when he placed his hands on them, what's the next part? He, he went on from there. You know what that means? He's got other things to do. He's not bored. He knew what he needed to do. He had somewhere to be. He had people to interact with. He had eternally significant things on his to-do list that had to get done. But yet he decided to spend his time in this way. It's almost as if he was saying, before I go to the cross, because we're talking about a week later, okay? Before I go to the cross, it's as if he's saying, even though the cross is the most significant thing that I could ever do in my life, imagine him saying this, before I, I do that, I'm going to spend some time with these kids. That's weird to me. The way he thinks about time is different from the way that we often think about time. He decided to invest into, into these people, to invest into these relationships, invest into the ones that others thought were less important. Even his own disciples. Oh, Jesus, this is less important. You shouldn't be doing that. Parents, don't bother Jesus with these kids. Take him away. He's got more important things to do. Can you picture it? You have things on your to-do list. I mean, maybe, maybe you wrote it down, maybe you didn't. How many of you are list makers? A 
I'll put my hand up. I'm a list maker. Doesn't it feel good to like check it off or mark it off? Yeah, okay. And even if you don't write out your list, you know in your mind that you've got some things that you need to get done. And the things that are on your to-do list are good things. Is there something that God asks you to do first? You got a to-do list. It's a good to-do list. Is there something God asks you to do first? Think about that while you watch uh, this uh, brief video. While uh, the man and the woman on the video are going to talk a little bit about how they spend time. Let's watch this together. When you have a neighbor that comes to you and says, we really want a bigger house or need a bigger house, uh, but we love our neighborhood, we love this neighborhood so much we can't move, it, it says something about the people around you. Uh, it says something about the fact that the efforts you've put in or the efforts others are putting in are actually paying off. We had a neighbor who um, suffered from cancer and uh, Ken offered to bring dinner over once a week while he was going through all the chemo and so forth, just to let his wife have a break. She said, you don't need to do that. I said, you're right, I don't need to do this, but it's something I want to do. It's something you can just on Tuesday nights, you don't have to worry about fixing dinner when you get home from work after struggling all day. You spend the evening with Jim and I'll, I'll come over and bring dinner. And we did that until Jim passed away. And it was just something we do because I was fixing dinner anyway. What's the difference if I put enough more on for two more people? So. It would be easier some days just to pull in the garage, shut the door down, but I want to get to know people. It means that, hey, I see him out there shoveling for his backyard so it'll grow better and it's a hot day. Uh, I'm driving home, I want to go in and grab a glass of lemonade or a glass of ice water, and I pick up my shovel and my wheelbarrow and I meet him out in the street and say, hey, let's get this done. Sometimes I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, I've even done that when, when I had places to be. So for me to sacrifice that and to uh, be a little bit late to what I had planned and to help somebody out is more important to me. Uh, you know, I was thinking about it just this morning. I, I let somebody go ahead of me. I was going to get a donut. You know, I, I waited for them. I opened the door, let them go in front of me and, and stand in line in front of me even. So, and at the end of it, I thought, well, it was 15, 20 seconds extra that I stood. If I can't give 15 or 20 seconds to somebody, what kind of, you know, what kind of love is that? What kind of person would I, am I if I can't give somebody 15 or 20 seconds of my time? Um, and in the same respect with your neighbors who you know that much better, uh, what is it if I give them 15 or 20 minutes? It's not a lot on my part, uh, but with our neighbor who was sick uh, and just taking dinner, it was five minutes of my time tops, but it meant so much to them because it was something that met a need in their life. And I think that's what God's called us to do is love others. Did you hear him say sometimes it would just be easier to just pull right in the garage? And if you've got a remote for your garage door, you hit the button, you pull in, you hit it again. There's, there's no interaction with the neighbors if that's the way it's going down. You didn't even get out of your car until after you were inside of the garage. He also said, sometimes I just don't want to do it. And I appreciate his honesty because I feel that way sometimes. I just, I just don't want to do it. And then he said, but it's more important. In fact, Jesus said it was the most important thing that we could do. I understand that we have a limited amount of time and energy in our lives. It's true of me just as much as it is of you. But if we're not strategic about the way that we spend time, then those choices are going to be made for us. And I really don't think that we're going to be happy when other people or other situations are dictating the way that we spend our time. So a moment ago, you indicated that uh, or many of you feel like, maybe all of us, I don't know, feel like that Jesus got a lot done. A lot of us feel like that Jesus got enough done. And we listed off what some of those good things were that Jesus did. But in all of the times that I have read about what Jesus did in his life, I have never once observed that it said he was in a hurry, that he was rushed that he was stressed out and frantic because of the things that he had to hurry up and get going, and he's got to go, and he's got to go. I feel that way sometimes. You may feel that way sometimes. But even though he did a lot, and even though he did enough, he wasn't in a hurry. If I were to come over to your home today, right after worship, 
Some of you are already thinking, what do I need to put away? What do I need to clean? What do I need to straighten up? If I were to come over, then, and, and that's normal, right? So you find out, like, somebody's coming over. We had friends that did this to us yesterday. They're like, hey, can we come over? Ah! <laughs> Empty the trash can. Put that thing away. Straighten up a little bit. And uh, here, in, in another text we'll look at here in just a moment, uh, it's in Luke 10. So if you want to start flipping pages there, you can. We're going to see an instance where Jesus actually did come over to somebody's house and what happened there in Luke 10. I want you to look at it with me, if you would, please. So Luke is uh, to the right of where we were in Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. We're in Luke. And we're going to go to chapter 10. We'll just look at three lines here in Luke chapter 10. It'll start in verse 38. I want you to see this with me. Luke 10, starting in verse 38, says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Come on in. Come on over. Come on in. Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But, in verse 40, Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me here to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. So you've got this person who opened their home up to Jesus. Is that a good thing to do? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to open your home up and welcome somebody over, that's good. If you're going to welcome Jesus over, that sounds really good to me. She was doing a good thing. But her sister, Mary, sat down at Jesus' feet, it says. She sat there and she was listening to him. And look again at verse 40. I read it to you. I want you to see it carefully. Look at it again. Martha was what? Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. It had to get done. That's some of the stuff on your to-do list, isn't it? I have to. I have to do these things. She was distracted by all of the things that had to be done. And they were good things. She's hosting Jesus in her home. The things that needed to get done were good things to do to make him and his disciples feel comfortable. Let me get you a pillow. Let me get you a glass of tea. Let me put the air conditioning on. Well, I guess that wouldn't have happened. But she was doing good things for them. And the Bible says she was distracted by them. And so how does she respond when she sees her sister is sitting at Jesus' feet while she is trying to do these good things? She complains. I get it. I totally understand. Many of us are thinking, well, yeah, okay. If, if she really had to do those things and she sees somebody's not chipping in, it's like the, the team project where somebody's not pulling their weight, you know, at work or in school, where everybody has a, a part to chip in on the team, but somebody doesn't. And you, ugh, you know, they, they gotta get their part done. The whole team suffers. That piece needs to get done. That's how she felt. That's what she's thinking to herself. These good things need to get done. And so she complains that Mary was spending her time, her sister Mary was spending her time in a way that she felt like was less important than the way that she was spending her time doing good things to welcome the Lord into her home. Look at Jesus' response then in verse 41. Martha complains. Jesus responds. Verse 41. Martha. Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, and indeed only one. Mary, that's the sister who sat down, Mary has chosen what is, do you see it? Mary has chosen what is better. The stuff Martha was doing was good, but Jesus said Mary has chosen to do what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Dude, I want to make sure you catch this. Jesus just reprimanded someone when they were serving him. Jesus just reprimanded someone who was doing good things. Isn't that weird? But then what he said was, there's something better. And this whole idea of loving our neighbors the way that God asks us to 
and, and then we face time constraints on our busy, hectic schedule, and we're doing good things in our to-do list, and Jesus is saying to us, there is something better. There's something that is the most important command that God has ever given to us. It wasn't wrong for Martha to serve Jesus. It wasn't bad for her to do that. She was doing good things, but it was better if she were to spend her time investing into relationship like her sister Mary was doing. If we're going to obey this great commandment to love our neighbors, we're going to need to relinquish doing some good things so that we can devote our time into doing things that are better, things that are more important, things that are the most important. Uh, a week ago, when we were together here in worship, I made mention to you this idea of uh, what, if, what if I experience this awkward feeling? I, I go to my neighbor whose name I maybe have forgotten or maybe I never knew, and uh, you may think to yourself, I've lived here for months or years, and I still don't know my neighbor's name, and, and so I'm going to go and I'm going to find out. And that what if they ask me, like, why are you doing this? And I said, you know, I get that that's awkward. Um, I want to give you a few ideas about what you can do in order to sort through that, all right? First, totally blame me. Why, why are you coming to talk to me? You haven't talked to me in years. You've lived there forever. Why are you talking to me all of a sudden? Just blame me. You can just say, well, my pastor has been talking about being a good neighbor, and I decided I want to be a better neighbor, so I came to introduce myself. That would work, right? And what you're expressing to them is you're saying, like, I want to be a good neighbor to you. Thanks, because they want you to be a good neighbor to them too. Um, another idea. This one you actually have to do before you go and say hi, okay? Just real briefly. You can um, plan a neighborhood gathering. It doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, we've done this a bunch of times, my wife and I. Invite people over. Uh, we tell them, bring your own chairs, because that way it's not, not complicated. It's simpler for us. Just bring your own chair, and we'll have coffee, and that's all it is. Or donuts, and that's all it is. Invite the neighbors over. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna have donuts. We're getting the neighborhood together. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, hey, block party, and all that. Well, okay, that's complicated. And you're asking people to come and spend a day together with people that they don't even know. But it's a lot easier to just be like, well, then come, come have a cup of coffee with us. You have a chance to uh, interact with your neighbors a little bit. Another idea, you might have some sort of a neighborhood group that already exists, like a neighborhood watch. If that group already exists in the area where you live, join it. You're already invited to join it. Uh, nobody's going to be like, why did you join? <laughs> I joined because I care about my neighborhood. I want my neighborhood to be a good neighborhood. And then when you're a part of that particular group, use it as an opportunity to get to know people better. You get to know your neighbors. That will lead towards you being able to love your neighbor the way that God has asked for us to love our neighbors. So just a few ideas I thought that might be useful. We'll talk about more in the weeks to come. Um, and there are some other ideas that may come to your mind that I would actually guard you against doing. Some of the first things that very frequently come to our minds when we think about, okay, if I'm going to love my neighbor, then I'm thinking I'm going to do these things. Some of those things, I do not recommend that you do those things. Um, like borrowing something that you don't actually have to borrow because you're starting a friendship based upon a lie. Don't do that, okay? We'll, we'll talk about some more of that stuff in, in the weeks to come. But, uh, um, but I feel challenged by this, and I hope that you do too. So I want to spend a moment in prayer with you. And then in, uh, in a moment after we pray, we're going to sing that song again uh, that, that we sung just a little while ago about asking God to build my life upon your love. We'll sing that in just a moment. Band, if you'd like to come up, you can do that, and let's pray together here. May we love our neighbors the way that God loves us. May we think carefully about the way that we steward our time. And may we take steps so that our lives will look more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.